everybody. Welcome back to the Dev Blog. I'm Keith Bergman in a different corner of the war room this time. Got my TRS-80 over there, my trusty VIC-20 at my side, some uh, well-organized cassettes behind me. And the reason I started doing the Dev Blog in the first place was because I think a lot of people get intimidated getting into retro stuff or really anything because they have so many questions that they think are dumb questions. They don't have a basic understanding of things and if you're like me, the only way you figure things out is to just bash your head into every wrong answer and knock down every wall with your skull and then eventually figure things out. But especially in like the retro computers and coding, you're dealing with hardware that's 40 years old, very arcane, doesn't always come complete with all the manuals. And if you're dealing with homebrew stuff, new creations, they're being made by hobbyists. Sometimes these people aren't the best documentation writers. Sometimes you have to glean through a bunch of YouTube videos and try to find that nugget of information that you actually need. It's not always an easy quest. And it's really it's really easy to give up. It's easy to get intimidated, not want to ask another dumb question of somebody and just stop doing it. And so one of the reasons that I'm documenting my own journey is so that maybe this can help somebody else not be as embarrassed to ask the dumb questions or to, you know, go about things in a clumsy way to get to where you're going. Case in point, I meant to do a lot of work on goats and golems last week when I was on vacation. Now, if you've been here before, you've seen me talk about the tippy. That is my Raspberry Pi that is inside the expansion box of my TI-99-4A. It allows me to have a server on there in which place I can keep my files. I can send them from my emulator. I can retrieve them. I can load them onto my original hardware. But I was going to use it as a server, and I put all my files on it at home when my laptop was on my home network. Now, I got to Alabama and fired up my laptop and tried to get into my tippy and it didn't work. And uh, the simple reason was I didn't know what an IP address, the difference between like a public facing IP address and a local in network IP address. So as the IP address that I had that I thought, you know, the 192.188.whatever that worked when I was on my own Wi-Fi network was not actually like a public out there for the entire web so I wasn't able to access my server but sitting there I was frustrated I didn't know if maybe I had misunderstood the entire function of the tippy and I thought maybe it didn't work in that capacity and that I wouldn't be able to access it remotely from some other network and uh, luckily that's not the case it is a really cool device I just didn't know a basic thing about IP addresses you know somebody right now watching this with a lot more technical knowledge than me is probably rolling their eyes thinking well who doesn't know that well me first of all for starters and a lot of other people so um, that's the reason why I didn't get as much done on goats and golems as I wanted to but I'm back from vacation I've put a little bit of work in and I wanted to demonstrate today one little side journey I took in my coding earlier today. One little nugget of just, you know, things where it could be a stumbling block or a setback, but if you take it with the right attitude, it can be something that gives you more insight and understanding and makes your game that much better. And uh, that's why these things always take a lot longer, but it's kind of a scenic route approach and you end up learning a lot more in the process. I'll give you a little explanation if you don't know what it's like to program in BASIC on a TI-99-4A. I'll break this down for you a little bit and then show you how I came up with a cool little hack just to make my game look that much better. All right, first of all, if you've never used one before, a TI-99-4A, the screen is divided into tiles. Every tile is an 8x8 square. There are 8 pixels by 8 pixels across, and these are the things that you define by filling in squares to make graphics. Now on the screen, there are 32 tiles across, 24 tiles down. Now a tile can be a letter, a number, a punctuation mark, it can be an invisible character, and there are some user-defined characters as well. But every character that you know, like in your alphabet and your numbers and all your punctuation, those characters all have a numerical code assigned to them known as an ASCII code. Now, ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And I know that because I wrote it on the back of this piece of paper. But every character has a code. So, for example, the letter A, uppercase, is ASCII code 65. B is 66. C is 67. Uh, over here, the pound or the hashtag sign 
is 35. The dollar sign is 36. Percentage sign is 37. You get the idea. Everything has an ASCII code. Now, on the TI-99-4A, you can redefine those codes. You can take the 8x8 eight eight grid that looks like a letter A and redesign it to look like a smiley face. And then, if you tell the computer to put character number 65 in the upper left corner, coordinate 1, 1, it's going to draw, instead of an A, a smiley face. It's still ASCII code 65, but you've changed it. But as far as the computer knows, it doesn't care what you put there. It just puts the same thing. And that's how you make graphics. You put all those little tiles together. And if you don't need letters in your game, you can go nuts. You've got tons of them. Extended basic goes all the way up to number 143. So you've got all kinds of, you have an entire lowercase character set. You have punctuation that nobody uses. When was the last time you used a tilde? That's the kind of things that you use to create your graphics. Here's the problem. The TI-99-4A groups all these characters into sets. For example, character set 8, ASCII codes 88 through 95. So you have your uppercase X, Y, and Z, your brackets, your backward slash, your caret thingamajig, your underline. All of those are in character set 8. Why does that matter? Because on the TI-99-4A, each character set can only have one foreground and background color. There are color codes. So let's say you type in in basic, call color 8, 5, 2. You have just said that all eight of those characters in character set 8 have a dark blue foreground and a black background. Not a very good legibility combination, by the way, but that's beside the point right now. The fact is you can't put infinite amounts of colors and infinite amounts of things together in like a true bitmap mode, you can only do these different batches of colors on various eight groups of eight characters. This leads to a lot of weird economy that you have to do with your, you know, your decisions. So like with goats and golems, I need green characters to make the mountains. So right there, there's character set 14 out the window. I need green with a white background to make the little tops with the snow-covered peaks on the top of each column, that's character set 13. Then you've got one that's red, you've got one that's gray, you've got the black one that we make the little goats out of. And we need eight cells for the left and right facing goats because we have the little animation of the goats flipping. So each goat has four little animation cells, basically. That right there is an entire section, an entire character set. What happens is you start running out of space. So let's go back to character set. I knew these things were going to mess me up. Let's go back to character set 8. We've used up all the superfluous characters we're not going to need. I still need text on the screen with the graphics. I have to cannibalize set 8. So I'm going to lose the X, Y, and Z because I need those, those characters to be certain colors and certain shapes to make my graphics, to make my status bar, to make the health bars over the different, you know, the different colors of things. So I need to use that up. Not a big loss in most cases. You don't really use the X, Y, and Z that often, but sometimes you need that Y. And not just... So I told you all that just to tell you about this little life hack that I came up with today. Uh, I needed a Y. I, the text at the bottom is all white with a blue background because it's all confined to the bottom two rows of the screen where the water is on the game board. So I needed a Y. I needed to print quit game YN in case you hit Q and you know the computer wants to ask if you're sure YN. So what I did, what I would get since I used the color set for that character set, this is what I would get on the screen. I would get quit game YN, but Y would be a different color. Not a big deal. And a lot of people did things like that back in the day with games, but there is a slick little solution. I just wrote a couple little subroutines couple little sub-programs. We'll get into those in another episode, maybe. But you, I just accessed a little subroutine. I wrote one called BY and one called YB. And all I did was copy the character data that makes a B, ASCII code 66, onto the Y. And then I printed quit game BN. Now, in the listing of the program, that's what it says. It says quit game BN. During the game, we have temporarily redefined that B to look like a Y. So the player doesn't notice anything. It's a seamless quit game YN. We get done with that. We change the B back to a B. Nobody's the wiser. 
So that's the kind of thing that can take a simple looking game like Goats and Golems and make it take a lot longer to put together. But those little scenic detours are all opportunities to learn and to get more little things in your toolbox, more little bits in your arsenal that you can use to make your next game run more smoothly, look better, be a more streamlined experience and a more pleasant experience for the end user because that's what we should be shooting for. I think, especially if you're making a game in a 40 year old kind of clunky language, anything you can do to smooth out the bumps in the road is gonna be a good thing. So I worked on that a lot this morning, and I, so like I said, I haven't gotten as far as I wanted to. I haven't gotten a lot of the attack, and I haven't even started on the golems yet, but I did do one cool thing, and I'll leave you with that little animation, and we'll see you next week here in the War Room. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you get first notice of every new episode of the Dev Blog and you don't miss a single saucy reveal. <laughs>